Good afternoon. My name is Jay Waters. I'm with the uh, Voices of Freedom Project and the American War Times Experience. Today is Sunday, 26 February 2023. We're in Crystal City, Virginia, in conjunction with our Seventh Corps reunion that we just did last night. But uh, John, if you could, for the record, just introduce yourself with your full name and where you were born and, and, and where you live now. Easy enough. John Stewart Tweedy Ergens is my full name. I go by John Ergens, okay. <clears throat> Born and raised in uh, Cutbank, Montana, educated in Montana, uh, went through law school, passed the bar, joined the, uh, joined the Army, so I go to Europe. Yeah. Well, and I went to Europe for about five years. Yeah, oh, and, and, we'll, and we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk about that in a second. Sure. Where, where do you live now? Currently Colorado Springs, Colorado. <clears throat> Excuse well, me. And, um, Thinking about like your family, parents, grandparents, uncles, did you have other folks in your family that had served in the military before you? Uh, one that I, uh, more than one, but uh, my stepfather okay. uh, served in Korea conflict. Okay. As a Marine, I think, with the 2nd Division Marines. Any, anybody else? Yeah, I had, uh, I had an uncle <clears throat> who served in the Navy during World War II in the South Pacific. In fact, he parked his wife in, uh, I think it was Williams, Williamsburg, or yeah, Williamson, North Carolina, okay. and that was his port of call, and then she didn't see him for five more years. Yeah. <laughs> kind of like you're, you're signed up for the duration. Exactly. Uh, so both of us had gone to Okinawa, as it turned out. Yeah, and, and well, I, like, I want to hear about that in a little <laughs> bit uh, as well. Um, well then, so taking a step back, um, and, and what, uh, what conflicts did you, did you participate in? I know you had multiple. Yeah, I did. Uh, first Gulf War, or Persian War, or Persian Gulf War. And then uh, uh, I was assigned to U.S. Central Command, who had authority for both Afghanistan and Iraq. And I was chasing legal issues across both theaters. So wherever my duties took me is where I went. So I wasn't assigned to a unit that was there, and I didn't have to do a 12-month rotation or a 15-month. But I would bounce in and out, and that assignment was over a three-year period. Okay. Over that, we get some more details. But over that three years, how many times do you think you went in and out of? Um, I've probably been up and down uh, Rat Irish, no less than twenty times. Wow. Yeah. And uh, in the Afghanistan, a little bit less. It was harder to get there on a gray tail than it would be to get into Baghdad. Yeah. But uh, when I would get to Afghanistan, most of my work was down in uh, uh, Kandahar in Herat. Yeah. And so I spent a little bit of time around the headquarters in Kabul, but most of my work was other places. Yeah, okay. Um, and then we'll take one more step back. Now think back to um, September 11th, 2001, when we had the attack on America. Where were you that day? And if you could just kind of tell us... Um, what was going on for you that day? Sure. Uh, for me personally, I was uh, I had flown back to Kedmack, Montana to bury my grandma. And she passed away at 96 years old. It didn't come to a shock, as a shock to anybody. But September 11th certainly did. And that was the day we were going out to her gravesite. And my dad was watching this TV program. And he liked sports on TV, but he never watched any other yeah. shows. But he's watching this very intently. And I said, Dad, what are you doing? He goes, get over here, take a look at this. And I said, well, what am I looking at? And then you see a bird go into the, the oh, tower. Oh. And I said, what show are you watching, Dad? He goes, this is real, it's happening now. Right. And I went, oh, well, I'm going to war, Dad. <laughs> yeah, because you were on active duty. I was on active duty, I was a major at the time. And where were you assigned at that point? Uh, Fort McPherson, Georgia, oh. as the deputy staff judge advocate. Um, but so with 9-11 up in Montana, what was, um like the mood, mood in the community. How did, oh, how did you remember from that? Somber. Yeah. Yeah, not only because we're at the funeral of a lady, and it's a small community, and she was raised herself and her family in that community, and she taught school in the school system for 45 years, so yeah. everybody knew her. Yeah. And so when she passed, I mean, there was just a lot of people that were waiting to go to the graveside and do the church funeral, and then, you know, all that stuff. <clears throat> but aside from that, the whole mood was just as somber as you could get. I mean, it was. Yeah. Did you still? Was it actually on September 11th? Was it, the funeral? Did it was. Still do it? Yeah, we did. Yeah. Wow. 
Yeah, well, everything was set, everything's ready to go. Anything stopping us? <laughs> what a, a lot of different decision making yeah. went into that to get to that answer. But yeah, it was, uh, it, it was not only what I remember my grandma's funeral, but I would also remember 9 11. Yeah, no, it's, uh, well, that's interesting. I mean, it must have been a tough day on uh, multiple levels. It was, it was. Well then, uh, so back to you, why did you join the, the military? Oh, always had a sense of service. I became a lawyer because I like to help people, sometimes help them in to go to jail, sometimes not, mm -hmm. <laughs> but helping them, I'm teasing. Anyway, uh, opportunity came up, it seemed like a good time of life for a life change. Once you take a, a bar examination and you get affiliated with a certain bar, you rarely leave that state because that's where your license yeah. is, right? And Montana has no reciprocity with any other state. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like I could go to Wyoming or North Dakota or Colorado because all those states required Montana to have that reciprocity. And they didn't have reciprocity with anyone. So if I was going to go to work as an attorney, it was going to be in Montana. So I decided, hey, let's go see if I, uh, I can find something else to do for a short time. I'll come back, sure. you know, because I really do like the state itself. And so I applied to the Army and they accepted me. Yeah, and uh, so did you go in as a lieutenant? First I did, lieutenant? yeah, first lieutenant. first lieutenant. Yeah, for six months and then I got pinned uh, captain's bars on April six. Fool's Day. Oh, right. six <laughs> months in and you were captain. <laughs> yeah. As opposed to those other guys, like four and a half years. To right. Work your way up. And what year was this then? Um, oh, 19. Uh, lieutenant wise. When you went in, I'm just oh, uh, 1989. 89. Okay. Yeah, it was a while ago. Yeah. Um, and so then, where was your first duty assignment? My first duty assignment was with Seventh Corps. Yeah. Okay. The headquarters was at Kelly Barracks in Stuttgart, but there was a bunch of satellite communities, and I was at one of those satellite communities. Okay. Which, uh, which one? Oh, Heilbronn. Yeah. I can't think of the concern's name right offhand. Well, then, so then fast forward to, um, I guess, August of 1990. Right. Um, Saddam Hussein invades Iraq. Uh, just tell us about right. your thoughts on that and what kind of what kind of happened next. Uh, I was I was a trial counsel, a prosecutor. It was a busy time. We had almost as many troops in Europe as we do in the army now. Wow. So yeah. it was busy. And I was busy, I was learning my trade, and was making mistakes and left and right, I'm sure, and, and trying to patch them together and so I can get this poor yeah. guy into trial, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So it was a busy time for me personally and professionally. But I do remember when Seventh uh, uh, President Bush ran down a roll call of units going to be deployed. I was in the MP station, and they had the only fax machine wired so you could fax something to the states. Yeah. And so I had the number, and I had the stuff I had to fax, and I'm standing there waiting for the fax to come open, and I'm just watching the TV, and they start, everybody stopped, and President Bush started naming units, and Seventh Corps was one of them. Okay. And it was like, huh, I'm not sure what that means, but. Yeah. <laughs> so now you knew you were gone. Right. Oh, the Seventh Corps was gone, and then they had to kind of piece and part, figure out what team they wanted to go with, and who was going to be the stay behind guys. But then it sounds like you were one of the uh, guys. Yeah. What was your timetable? Uh, uh, I actually left, I think it was right after Thanksgiving. Okay. I remember being in my place on Thanksgiving, but geared up and ready to go, bags packed, you know. But uh, it was the oddest flight going down, I remember, because all the overhead bins, where, you know, we put, typically put hand luggage and all that stuff, it was full of pistols, rifles, yeah. everything. Yeah. You know, it, you, this would never happen in real life. Right? Was it a, a military flight or no, was it a it was civilian contracted? Civilian contracted. Yeah. 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 yeah I, 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 now that you mention it, I remember that too, with the weapons <laughs> going up top. Was, yeah. <laughs> it, just, it just caught me. It was like, okay. And, and, and a civilian commercial airline. Right. And you're putting all these weapons in there. Just, <laughs> yeah, it did seem kind of. Uh, well, tell us about um, so. your time in. in uh, Desert Storm there. Uh, actually, uh, I found that I, I loved the Army in the field. I wasn't so keen on the Army in garrison. Um, it just seemed like a lot of nitinoid, a lot of rules to follow. Yeah. And I'm, I was okay with it. I could survive three years and then I'd just go about my business, you know. Yeah. But I at least had a chance to, to join an organization larger than I was, which I liked. 
and then to do it in a very nice place in Europe, which I liked even more. Sure. Sure. But at the end of the day, when I went down, and we were initially sleeping in GP mediums, and it was uh, George was there, Charlie was there, uh, uh, Walt Huffman yeah. was down at the in his sword major, and I can't think of the sword major's name. But uh, uh, Charlie was the guy over at the museum the other yes. day, yep. and I took I was on his tour, and he's very knowledgeable and uh, did a great job. But he did mention he goes, I wonder every day I learn something new, and so what have I learned from you guys that's new that I didn't know before? And somebody kicked in something. And he goes, Yep, that's it. But later I'm just talking to him because I'm his friend. I go, Charlie. I was going to offer up, but you already knew this, so it didn't really apply. But waking up to uh, Garth Brooks, Friends in Low Places, because that was the Colonel's favorite song at the time. <laughs> so our major would tee it up before we'd go to sleep, and he, so he, when the Colonel wanted to get up, he just clicked it. And what time were y'all getting up? It, um, we did stand guard, so we did, uh, like uh, George Thompson was a, uh, we called him the Sergeant of the Guard. But we had a, a certain minor perimeter we had to protect. Yeah, he was talking about that yesterday. Yeah, yeah. and then they buddied us up with the chaplains. I'm not sure why that was, but they weren't a lot of help manning guard posts. <laughs> yeah. yeah so, so George, there were three majors, two majors, a guy named Carlton Jackson and George, and then there was like five captains. And then we had the enlisted component. So they buddied up... A, M16 with a 45, and that was the how it was set. And then George would make something warm, coffee, hot chocolate, yeah. and take it, bring it out to us about halfway through our shift. And I think our shift was three or four mu or four hours oh, a wow. ton. Yeah. But yeah. your feet would get cold. It's cold out there. Was it 24 hours a day? Somebody no, out there or just uh, no. Uh, during the daylight hours, it didn't have to worry about it so much. Yeah. I don't remember, and the burn pit was out there, and there was always somebody by the burn pit, yeah. you know, and so you didn't really have to what go. Were they burning, for the record? Oh, <laughs> human waste. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but they actually, the engineers really did a nice job, but I've never been on a four-seater before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, um, in addition to guard duty and that kind sure. of stuff, what were your, like, day-to-day -day, um, My duties? My initial, uh, when I went down there, what I was supposed to do was legal assistance. Okay. And I kind of thought to myself, so everybody's kind of spread out. Nobody's got wheels, so nobody's really moving except you know the, the higher level commands. So I thought, well, it's a big perimeter, but after a while, legal assistant, I, I, I'm going to run out of things to do. Well, that's what was my thought. And then people started finding, uh, figuring out that there was legal assistance offered at this particular location, and guys on like ADA troops. They would bring in a deuce and a half choke full of guys with legal problems. And you never knew, they never called ahead, you never knew. But as soon as one of those, you got legal assistance, and you'd hit it at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you just, uh, we didn't have much for lighting, so there, it was pretty dark. And there wasn't much privacy, so some of the stuff I had to, we, I just took them out to the sandbags and I sat with the soldier and talked, so you had the confidentiality of it. Right, but you had to worry about that because you're intense, yeah. and so it's like, ah, huh, how's that gonna work? Yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so I did a lot of legal assistance, very interesting things. Usually, initially, with people with, uh, uh, it struck me, people with kids that have been handed off to somebody else, keep them in the same school. Something happened at the school; they didn't have a, a piece of paper or whatever they needed to keep that kid enrolled. And big kerfluffle would go on. It would go through the rear debt commander, up through, down through, around yeah, through, yeah. and then go find that person and then get them to legal assistance. So uh, I did make a deal, well, with uh, General Huffman now, at the time Colonel Huffman. I said, I need to be able to sign, uh, send occasionally, uh, you know, waivers and stuff like that to schools to keep these kids. Yeah. And he fully understood, so. There was a little trailer. I didn't know much about it, but that's where all the satellite stuff was. Okay. And so they would put it in a scanner, and they'd satellite it to wherever 
it went. Sometimes I'd just satellite to a post camper station that was close yeah. and then call those guys and say, hey, listen, I just sent, or I will send to this number. Is this a good number? Is this what I need you to do for me? I need you to pick up that piece of paper and go down to, I don't know, Mount Vernon Elementary School yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and talk to Sherry Nevitz, yeah. <laughs> whoever that person yeah. is. Make stuff yeah, that kind of thing. Well then, um, it, but it did cost like 13 bucks a minute to use that satellite. Yeah, so it, there was a fiscal, uh, I don't know, you wanted to be cautious about what you sure. did. And then concise, brief. Right, yeah, absolutely. Um, well then fast forward a little bit to, in fact, 32 years ago right now, uh, oh. when the ground war kicked off. Did you, sure. did you move forward with the, with the core or what did you end up doing? No, uh, I watched the core do its left hook very quietly. And that's in a, if there's one moment in my entire career where I fell in love with the Army, it was watching all those guys, all those vehicles, endless vehicles, moving really quiet across the desert in so the you, roads. You could actually see that. Oh, yeah, I, I sat on the berm that they were going to cross. I was on that side of it. Yeah. And uh, I just watched it I was probably four or five hours, and it was like you know, all sorts of makes and models. Everybody's being really quiet. You know, uh, uh, bumper to bumper, real nicely. The tanks, the Bradleys, everybody was just being really quiet. And what, what time was that? It was probably in the afternoon before the ground war started, or maybe a, couple, maybe a day or so before. And it they were all going in the same direction? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, it was probably eight or nine lines of vehicle that were endless, moving all at the same pace. Were there a lot of other soldiers and officers? Not a bunch, no, because nobody had any wheels to go any place. Yeah. You know, at one point I had set up a uh, roving legal assistance yeah. because some folks didn't uh, have a vehicle to get troops to me. So we set up a deal where I would go with an NCO when a vehicle was available, and I would just go visit all these other camps sure. and during the daytime never at night you know so you don't run into that hostile fire stuff yeah. right or friendly fire. Oh, oh yeah yeah friendly fire sorry and and so I I did mobile legal assistance and I think it was on one of those trips where I stumbled across all these things it's like er, I gotta watch this yeah. I, uh, I, I'm I know I was I think it was L uh, L Williams Sergeant first class L Williams was my quote unquote driver. Okay. So the, the two yeah, yeah. So there was a team of two. Well, I'm sure the commanders and leaders and, and soldiers, for that matter, appreciated you coming out there. Yeah, I didn't realize what a big service it would be until I got there and saw what the need was. Yeah. And was like, oh, yeah, I'm actually doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And I kind of like it. Yeah. Right. Good for, you. Good for you. Did you, um, did you actually see any? Combat or Scud missiles or no? Any of that? Uh, <laughs> I don't think I did. What I did see a lot of was uh, gunnery from tanks because okay. the the range was right by where okay. we lived, yeah. and also the uh, uh, what's the steel on target missile uh, MLRS? Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, well they were re revamping those guys after yeah, movement. Mo right, right. Yeah, and, and so uh, and, and yes, loud. Oh, they'd only do like one, two, and it just, just go. Phew. And then they go, because they're, re they're yeah, 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 but they would do that for like five days in a row with all the different launchers. Wow. <laughs> wow. Um, but no, it, it wasn't hostile by any means. Well, and did you have any friends or colleagues or soldiers that uh, were, were wounded or anything? No. Yeah. No, we were all, well, in a, it, it happened so darn quick in a sense, yeah. right? Yeah. And we were prepared. We had, you know, we had our rear, we had our main, and we had our advanced, and we had already broken into teams, and I was with the main. Uh, the rear guys, I'm not sure, the main and the rear, at least in my opinion, well, from my view at that particular time in my career, the main and the rear were one. But everybody was identified, if we need to do X, right. you will go here and you will go here. Yeah, and plus, I mean, you can elaborate on this, but you didn't know how long you were gonna be there. Oh, agreed. Yeah, you had no idea, yeah. right? And, you know, some of the estimates were kind of scary. And, and uh, we didn't have much as far as radio goes. We did listen to uh, Baghdad Betty until she went off the air after the air war started. But you weren't getting, uh, we want, uh, if we could pick it up, we'd do the BBC. Yeah. What was uh, Baghdad Betty saying to you, though? Do you remember? Oh, uh, same stuff they did in uh, Tokyo Rose, didn't. Uh, 
American soldier, blah, blah, blah. It was in English. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's stilted English, but English. Yeah, you, know, you can understand what she was saying. Yeah. You know, well, one of those things. I, I hadn't, I, intuitively, I should have known that that occurred, but I hadn't really heard that. It, it didn't hear it for long. <laughs> <laughs> well, after the air war starts, right? Yeah. And some of us were out in guard duty, and they flew right, those yeah. jets were burning, okay. and they flew right over us. It knocked us down. Yeah. They were so low. It was like, whew. It was like, holy crap. And down you'd go, just that after blast, right? And you're glad it, they're on our side. Oh, my gosh, yeah. But we didn't listen to Betty anymore after that day. Um, well, while you were deployed, uh, were you able to stay in contact with... with um, Loved ones? Did you have people back in Germany? Or oh, sure, yeah. I had, uh, well, uh, friends back in Germany and loved ones back home. Okay. And uh, uh, AT&T was gracious enough to give us free minutes, but the phones were 40 miles away. So you had to find a ride. Or typically what you'd do is say, all right, Tuesday afternoon, we've we got to do some half. So we all could go. Or we, we got a Suburban, so half of us can go. And then they w we would drive down yeah. to get to the AT&T place. And then you'd have 15 minutes. And it was on uh, you know, a phone attached here and a phone attached here. And so we, there was no privacy whatsoever. Yeah. But I would just go down and I'd have like 20 numbers. If somebody didn't answer, I didn't wait around for it. Yeah. I just hung up and dialed the next one in line until I got to somebody. And I said, hey, this is John. I'm calling you from undisclosed place in Saudi Arabia. Hey. The first thing I would like you to do for me, if you're willing, is to call my folks and tell them I'm okay. Because the mail was this ab yeah. abysmal. Did you get some mail though, coming and going? Only after I got back to home station in Germany. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had a guy yesterday, he said uh, he only wrote a few letters home, but he got home before. Or the letters got there. So when he finally got back, then the letters were arrived. <laughs> I, I, am, uh, I am not surprised with that. Well, speaking of home, what was um, what was your homecoming like getting back to uh, Germany? Uh, it was awesome. Uh, the Germans were glad to have you back. I lived in a neighborhood I didn't live on post, so all my na German neighbors, when they knew I was going to war, and, and that means something to them than it did to me, they they were frightened that yeah. they would never see me again. <clears throat> They would have me over, guys would give me hugs, women would cry on my shoulder. I mean, it was just for a fairly uh, staid society, they had a lot of emotion. Yeah. And then when I came back, it was like, whoop, 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 break out the cognac. You know, you know you're something if they're going to break out the cognac for you. Did you come back as a unit? Or well, we did, or yeah, as a unit into Kelly Barracks and then went out to our home stations. Okay. Okay. And so. I didn't get back to Montana. My, my grandma and my mom were after me. I thought, well, if I'm going to take any time off, you know, take my leave time, I'm not doing it in Cutback, Montana, Mom. <laughs> yeah. I, not when I can go to Prague, I can go to Paris. I, <laughs> you did, you, did you get some time off? Oh, yeah, I did. I did. Yeah. 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 Oh, well, yeah, they bent my ear so hard. I finally went to the boss and said, hey, boss, I got to have um, 10 days. <laughs> did you go to Montana? Montana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You go back. Yeah, well, the little town had set up a parade for me. So, oh, yeah. oh yeah, what was that like? It was it was awesome. It, it, a lot of fun. They they announced it a couple of days before I got home. I didn't know anything about it. My parents in the nearest airport, you, commercial airport, you could fly into is about an hour and a half, two hours away. And what, what airport is that? Now, Great Falls, Montana. Okay. Yeah. And so by the time I got back to Kedbank on the east end of town. My dad pulls over and there's a bunch of cars just all kind of lined up. And I go, what's going on here? He goes, oh, you're the man of the hour. Push me out and, you know, the Chevrolet dealership has its old old uh, Cadillac or, you know, whatever it is. So you're sitting up like, right. sitting up in the back and yeah. just driving really slow down Main Street. And the fire guys are honking their horns. Yeah. And the police are out and the Montana Highway oh, Patrol. Oh, for you, right? You uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's excellent. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. I never thought I would be able to see something like that. Yeah, well, um, so back in Saudi Arabia, I'm kind of kind of jumping around, but sure. um, it sounds like you were pretty busy, but did you get some free time, I think, downtime? And, and if, if so, did you, yeah. what'd you, what'd you end up doing? What were you doing on the internet? I mean, mainly read. Books. So. Yeah, we didn't, you know, we didn't really have an internet at that point. Yeah. And uh, I had taken down uh, a bunch of just paperback books. Yeah. That I thought, well, yeah, if nothing else, I can put them in a rucksack. And I can, I, I'll have something to do. 
Oh, that was me. Yeah, that was my. Yeah, we, don't, we, want, we don't want you to be late. Yep. Anyway. Uh, Still okay on the time, though, right? Uh, it's, yes, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, so you had paperback books. Yeah. Uh, Were you passing them around other guys? Yeah, yeah, and vice versa. You know, one of those things. It, it, and then you're just uh, talking about the scuttlebutt going around. Well, and uh, this kind of question answers itself because you're here for the reunion, but the, one of the questions we like to ask, did you keep in touch with folks from uh, yes. the 7th Corps and Desert Storm? Yeah. Yeah, yes. so yeah, it yeah. seems like you're... SJA community both then and throughout your career is pretty tight-knit. It is. Yeah. yeah, so long as you're not a dirtbag. <laughs> but if you are a dirtbag, you're going to find out, right? Yeah. Uh, it has its own winnowing process. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, now kind of, or was there anything else about Desert Shield, Desert Storm? Uh, uh, the only other... Funny or tragic or stand out to you? <laughs> yeah, a number of funny incidents that I won't talk about. It's not because they're classified, just I'm not sure it's what you want to hear. But uh, uh, along the way, the chief of claims for Seventh Corps got sick. I think mm. I never really knew, but but she was exfilled back to Germany, back to Launch Tool, and so I became the chief of claims, plus doing the legal assistance business. And just being the chief of claims and trying to pay Saudis or pay Bedouins or <clears throat> there's there's a uh, Air Force was responsible for the payment, but I, as an Army guy, was adjudicating who got what, right? Yeah. Well, like what's an, I, I think I know, mm -hmm. but I'd rather hear from you. Like, what's an example of something you were adjudicating? Uh, we had a couple of troops kill some camels that were walking by. And I, I thought mm -hmm. you were going to say that. <laughs> but uh, the other... Accidentally? Or, or, oh, oh, no, 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 no. They just were bored. <laughs> so what's the price of a camel? Uh, there are a number of... Yeah, yeah, well, I can't even remember the exact price, but what I did find out, there are a zillion types of camels. This one particular was a Yemenese racing camel with calf. <laughs> that was expensive. It, it, it was, no, but you had to fight, yeah, everything was expensive, right? Wow. The, the other one, though, I thought was funny as all get out. Poor guys come, poor, this poor guy comes in, the MP's got a hold of him. <coughs> And he hands, just hands me a piece of paper. He doesn't speak English at all. And I don't have no interpreters around me. And it's an IOU from Colonel Sanders. <laughs> and Colonel Smith felt. And the guy's complaining to somebody. These guys that gave him this took his truck. <laughs> wow. I want to be paid for my truck wow. based on that proof. And was that legit? No. No. No, I went to the Air Force and I said, hey, listen, just out of a sense of cooperation, yeah. this truck, we'll just put a dollar amount on it, we'll just pay it, but the proof, I don't even, if, I have no early, earthly idea if you even had a truck. Yeah. Did you give him some money then? <laughs> nope. No. And at the end of the day, I said, it's Air Force call, it's your money, yeah. you know, what would you like me to do with it? And they were back, of course, they're sitting back in uh, Germany, <laughs> like, nope, can't do that. I said, all right. So well, that's I, a little suspicious that it was Colonel Sanders. Oh, oh, huge. And Colonel's misspelled, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> and then Colonel Waters. Oh, yeah. or exactly. Anything else, maybe. Yeah, but Sanders, no. That's spelled wrong. It was, it was funny. Yeah, that is funny. That is funny. Um, well, now kind of just jumping around, because in the beginning you said, um, you know, time in Afghanistan, time in Iraq. Sure. Um, you know, as much detail as you want, or if you want to compare and contrast things that you saw in Desert Storm versus mm. later, or... You know, whatever you kind of want to, whatever path you want to go down. Uh, I think the legal issues were more complicated in Iraq and Afghanistan. There, you mean we, we made George uh, Thompson gave him a warrant, a contracting warrant. So, and we'd run up a vehicle for him to go buy heaters, fuel, carpeting for the for the tent. Because we lived in that tent, I don't know. We fell back into KKMC after the ground war was over. So it was probably three months, four months, and just all in a GP medium. Yeah. But George was, and so it was easier. We just sent George out, and he, he came back with what we needed. You mentioned that yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, at the end of the day, I think the legal issues, at least in my opinion, were more complicated. But then again, I wasn't working at George's level or the Colonel's level. Maybe they were working issues I knew, no need to know about and not my worry. 
but I was a more senior guy at Afghanistan and Iraq, and I was working for the higher headquarters for both. And so sometimes when you spoke, you spoke for CENTCOM, which would mean General Abizade. Well, I don't speak for General Abizade ever, yeah. but they would take it like you would. CENTCOM said, you know. Wow. Yeah, yeah, so you had to be careful, but there were some complicated things that nobody at a lower level could figure out. Right. And it typically would be fiscal. Sometimes it's the ICRC in detainee operations. I mean, that was a, that was a big ball of wax, yeah. you know kind of a Gordian knot like Afghanistan, right? And then uh, on top of that, I guess, uh, rules of engagement. Because we had the coalition, at least at the CENTCOM level, we kept track of every country's rules of engagement and their exceptions thereto, and what those exceptions said. It, it, it just turned into a huge book. Yeah. Yeah. But the Canadians look differently than the Brits versus New Zealand versus Australia versus us, yeah. Yeah. France, mm -hmm. Germany, I mean, all that kind of stuff, right? And they all have exceptions. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess same, same kind of thing from uh, both of those deployments or any of those deployments, Iraq and Afghanistan. Are there any specific incidents, scary or funny or strange or just interesting you want to talk about? Probably once out of every three times, maybe even more frequent than that. Somebody in our train going from Baghdad Airport to the Green Zone down Route Irish, there was an IED explosion, okay. right? And you knew it was going to happen, you just hoped it wasn't your vehicle. Yeah, and so what kind of vehicle? Uh, 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 up on Murdered Humvees, Humvee. yeah. With a couple guys? Yeah, yeah it, it, basically, yeah. yeah. Did you ever get hit by an IED? Uh, no, no, I, I was the second car right behind a couple of times. I was, yeah, yeah, that's close enough. That you, your eyeballs almost want to come out of your head, type of, and then the screams and the shouts and the hurts. Yeah, it's terrifying. Yeah, and then the black smoke, because things are burning. You know, the rubber is burning and it's black and it's stinky and all of this happened and all at once. <laughs> yeah. Did you actually ha ever have any insurgents that you were engaging with on these? Uh, just once in a while. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you get somebody kind of rat-a-tat -tat, rat at you, popping some, popping, and, and they're not very, they don't have enough ammunition to become really good at, at shooting. <laughs> Fortunately, For, Fortunately, absolutely, right? Um, and yeah. so, well, that's tough. Yeah, no, it, uh, it happened more frequently than I would like it to have. Yeah. But there's been a couple of times, too, that in Afghanistan with, with things going on, almost got in a helicopter crash, <clears throat> going over one of the passes. We're 12 feet off the ground, doing about 50 miles an hour, and everything in the hopper's mushy. And you're, you're going, ooh. And if there was a big rock in that flight path, you were going to hit that big rock. It, but it, the pass was only, what, I don't know, a few hundred yards uh, wide. Right. So you, <laughs> you're going, oh, my gosh, only a couple more yards, you know? Yeah. And just scary stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the same kind of question that we talked about at Desert Storm. Uh, did you get any downtime? Any, any Oh, sure. Things, yeah, any, any, anything yeah. stand out that you did or? No, uh, once again, I'm, I'm a reader, so uh, uh, people like to have their cigars at the night, yeah. and so people would do that. I'm not a cigar smoker, but I always, every time I came through Cutter on a commercial bird, I would stop by and get like five boxes of like Cuban cigars, yeah. because you could get them in Cutter, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. I'd get like five boxes, but when I went forward, I would take a box to the senior legal guy and say, hey, these are for your guys. And then, you know, it, it, you do that enough, you build up a, it, it just helps everybody sure. do difficult things. It's just good, good for morale. It is. Helping people out. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And they weren't all, it, well, what, darn the expense. I mean, it was like, you know, those guys down there can really use it, and there's no way for them to get to here. Right? <laughs> well, so these, these um, deployments in and out of Afghanistan and Iraq, were they short? Time things or? Uh, yes. Uh, all of them were time sensitive. So there, that lends itself to be short duration. Right. And, you know, I was, a, I was a legal advisor to a couple of investigating officers on investigations you know about. Yeah. Okay. You know, now. Yeah, but, but, yeah, but before anybody else knew about them, we were investigating it. Yeah. And that sometimes took a lot longer than you would think. Yeah. 
kind of yeah. Anything you want to share, or you want to kind of leave that. No, yeah. uh, Haditha, son of Haditha, uh, Mosul. You know, just yeah. Uh, there's a bunch of them that run through my head, but okay. yeah, I was but as not. As far as going in and out, were there homecomings for that, or it was like no. some kind of yep. Got to be routine. Yeah, for me, and that I kind of kept it that way around my house too. It wasn't like daddy's going, you know. Well, so, yeah. but how was so you were married? And I was. I, I yeah, I had two kids yeah. at the time. So how, from your perspective or from your wife's feedback, what was it, the home front situation like? How, how did that <laughs> it, it was, at the end of the day, she looked at me and she goes, "It's easier when you're deployed because my schedule is a lot more fixed." <laughs> <laughs> when you're, because even though uh, if I was in Tampa at CENTCOM headquarters, I was working seven days a week, and so he, she never knew when I was going to show up. It was nice. I take Sunday morning. I take my oldest son, and he would just go play whatever he was playing inside my office, so I could spend some time with him. Mm. You know, yeah. but we, yeah, that's uh, we did that for three years, yeah. and I also had a, uh, a stew underneath my bed at home. So I could, so I could talk. Yeah, just to tell folks what a stew phone is. Oh, it's a class. It, it's a class. Uh, a phone you can, up to a certain level, put classified information over. Yeah, okay. in, just in case somebody's watching. Yeah. This, they <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it, and then I just, I'm just curious, because from my own perspective, I'd like to hear yours. Did it ever feel like somehow life was easier when you were deployed? Because you, mm -hmm. you were maybe still working seven days a week, but you didn't have the. Right. Trying to be with the kids and your wife sure. and do work seven days a week, whereas right. when you're deployed, you love your family to death. Did you ever have those kind of feelings? Oh, huge. Yeah. yeah. No, it, it, it made my life a lot easier to be forward. Yeah. yeah. We're never supposed to tell her. No, no, no. Heaven sakes. Yeah, oh, of course, now I'm on film. Shoot. Yeah, no, I, yeah, yeah I, I, I think at this point they would understand. Oh, she and a hundred. Yeah. It was easier on her, too, if I was just gone. It, it, she oh. said it lovingly, of course, but it's like, you want me gone? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think on the way up, you mentioned something about being in Okinawa, too? Oh, I was. I was the uh, staff judge advocate, the senior legal guy for the Army in Okinawa. Okay. Just, what was that like? Oh, it was great. I, uh, our little piece of Okinawa was uh, called Tori Station, hmm. and it was an old Japanese hangout. And it was, it, 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 the Okinawans really don't consider themselves Japanese, and neither do the Japanese consider Okinawans Japanese. So there's a... <clears throat> so they, when they kept the name Tory Station, there was a purpose f behind it. Okay. I don't get it myself, but they do. But it was uh, we had sugar cane fields on our post that uh, the farmers would come in, and we allowed them to work. But it was an enclosed perimeter, so they had to, you had to know who the farmer was and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it was right on the beach, South China Sea, I think it was. Um, my my office had a magnificent, probably 56 by 56 inch picture window. And so I'm working at my desk and I'm looking out and you can see the nice reef and, the, and watch the little boats go back and forth and then the fast moving jets go into Kadena. Okay. But they would fly, that was their flight path coming back. Well, a lot of Marines. A lot of Marines, right. And they were on the other side of the island. Okay. Did you have your family with you? I did, I had my wife and two kids. How was that from? Uh, it was fun, yeah. yeah. It, 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 and my wife was one of those gals that's like, I don't know, let's go give her a try and make the most of it. You ever get island fever? No, not so much. No, okay. no. Okay. Uh, some people did. Yeah, you know, they get real antsy. How, how long a tour was? Uh, two now? years. Two. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, we're kind of still jumping around. Anything else sure. from either your your career or any of the deployments? You know, I, I might have a little bit of a warped perspective on some things. You know, I was a captain for like nine years, then I made major, right? And then Okinawa was my first SJA job as the SJA, okay. the senior That's guy. Time, right. right, but I was an SJA five, four more times after that, and then finished up my career as a military judge. Okay. But I'm so strictly on the legal basis, you know, the, the, the legal parameters that, yeah. I know what RM does, because I deal with money too, right? But <clears throat> Contact, uh, move into contact for an infantry guy? <laughs> how to, uh, how to you know, take a platoon and actually make that whole platoon work together, you know, that kind of thing? Nah, I'm not probably so good at. But it sounds like you actually did a lot of that stuff. I did. Guard duty, and guard, sergeant of the guard, sure. and convoys, and tactical stuff, operation, I mean, everything. I, uh, dep no matter what job I had, what unit I was assigned with, I always felt that I could be a better attorney if I understood my, what my client was doing. 
And so that, uh, that's artillery, and that's engineers, and that's right. infantry, right. and special forces. And, you know, I was part of a 10 special forces group, and they were a, cold, were a cold weather group. And so I would go out and spend a week sleeping in snow caves and making communications. It's not to survive the wilderness, you have to operate in the wilderness, which is a whole different thing. But being from Montana, I already knew how to cross country ski. I already knew, you know, I, avalanche, yeah, that, that is probably gonna be an avalanche. You just stand back and look at it because you'd seen it so much. Yeah, wow, wow. Yeah, well, so uh, you mentioned towards the end of your career, kind of, um maybe kind of wrap up your career, sure. how many years, or where were you? Yeah, uh, spent 28 years, 27 years, 11 months. For some reason, the, the nice lady in white tennis shoes wanted me to quit a, a month early for pay purposes. I, I didn't really, I said, yes, ma'am, go ahead. <laughs> Who knows? So I just call it 28 years. Anyway, uh, had some really good, exciting jobs, but the best thing about the Army is the people. Yeah, I, I, I can go any place and do almost anything with the right crowd, right? And that, that's what it taught me sure. is yeah. I, I've been in some terrible places, yeah. you know? And my boss, and when I was in Italy, it changed from not only being CTAF, that still r remains, but it also then became U.S. Army Africa. That's right. Yeah, we were talking about that on <coughs> right. the bus the other day. So he, w he's a land he was the land force guy, and they don't have navies and air forces all that much in Africa. They have land forces. So it, it, he was a big deal when he would show sure. up, right? Yeah. But he would want me to go along and scope out how are they doing discipline. You know, just give me a sense of that arrogance. Of another. Yeah, and then, yeah, yeah. Hmm. And so I would meet with their leaders, and most of the time they had a couple of attorneys and I would meet with them, we would talk over different jurisprudence and how they, you know, yeah. it was interesting. Yeah. But I also found myself at one point on the banks of the Ebola River. Okay. <laughs> and that's where again? Where is In it? Africa. Yeah, but specifically where? Oh, it, it was... Uh, oh, that doesn't matter. Yeah, no, no, that's, it's getting too close to the line. Yeah, no, 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 <clears throat> yeah, but that's where Ebola comes from. Yeah, yeah, no, no, right. no, no, as soon as you said that, I was getting nervous. Um, well, how about retirement, sir? What was that like for you? Oh, uh, to be honest with you, it was pretty simple. Yeah. I uh, uh, finishing up being a judge, you don't have really a unit that's with you because you're so stovepiped. You stovepipe right back yeah. into the leadership of yeah. the JAG Corps. Yeah. Nobody on Fort uh, Stewart, Fort Gordon, or Fort Benning could g give me an order. Not even the CG because I didn't belong to them. Yeah. Right. When you're a colonel. Right. Right. I'm, I'm 06. 06. But yeah, yeah. But oh, and I never even thought of. I look at it and I'm like, yeah, that's true. But you know, the boss tells me to go do something. It you know doesn't not a conflict of interest. I'm yeah. going to go do it. Right. Yeah. 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 Sure. But uh, at the end of the day, it's the people. Yeah. Right. And when I got off, my family had already left. We'd sold the house. My family has already left. Oh, okay. Uh, they went back toward Leavenworth, and where we have a bunch of friends that are there. And uh, the last two weeks, I was by myself finishing up the house. And so on one Friday afternoon, my uh, uh, the, the guys, both on defense and on the prosecution side, they came and got me and wanted me to take my last salute on Friday afternoon. Yeah. Then they handed me the flag. That's nice. So we had 40 guys out in the parking lot taking the last salute, yeah. and that was it. Still got the flag, I'm sure. Uh, yep. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I got in my car and I left. Yeah, wow. Um, and then what'd you do since you'd been out of the military? I uh, uh, took a civilian job with uh, uh, Northcom, and which would be NORAD also. And NORAD is the Canadian piece of Northcom. Sure. Okay. And Northern Command's duty is to protect all interior boundaries of North America, which would include Mexico. Some people don't quite un get that whole thing. But it's North America, right? <laughs> are, you, are you still doing that? Now? No, no. I, uh, I, I, it wasn't a great fit. I'm not a good civilian employee. I, I just, it, it, in working around military, I, I'm just too ingrained with. Good. It just didn't fit. Okay. So I, I retired. Yeah, good for you. Yeah. And you come to Desert Storm uh, reunions. Right. Exactly. Well, there's a, a couple more questions towards the end here. Um, how do you think your and you have a lot to choose from, but how do you think your wartime uh, experience affected your life, the rest of your life, and, and how do you think it will affect you going forward still? 
Uh, one thing, it, not that I had any problems understanding it before because I was just born and raised in kind of a rough and tumble environment in Montana between, between ranching and farming, oil rigs, oil and gas. I did all of that, so I, and everybody did, so I was no, uh, nothing different than anybody else. But when you get into a situation like in the first Gulf War, where you're fairly isolated, not a lot of communication, it shows you what hard is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so even now, <clears throat> you won't see me saying, that was so hard, or I got bad news, right? I know what bad news looks like, that's not it. You know, one of those, it taught me that. It, it gave me that perspective. Sure. And it, I've held that ever since the first Gulf War, but also in Iraq and Afghanistan, I've seen bad, I've seen hard. And when people say, oh my gosh, my favorite show isn't on, that's terrible. I'm, I don't say a word, but my wife knows exactly what I'm thinking. You ain't seen bad if you think that's bad, right? right. <laughs> that's, that's good perspective. Um, and then kind of related to that, looking at your whole body of work, um, if there's one thing that you'd want your kids or grandkids or quite frankly future generations to know about you and your military service, what, what, what would that be? What would you want them to know? Hmm. I love my family. Family before self. That's good. Absolutely. Um, and then the last question is truly proverbially the last question. Is there anything else that you would like to share or I have dark, visit? I have darkened your door way too long as it is. But no, thank you so been, much for the opportunity. This has been excellent. I um, really appreciate the, the time and opportunity. We talked a lot over the weekend. And right. I, I didn't even think about this yeah, until you mentioned it out in the hall. I said, I said well, and you, of course, check my watch. I got a flight. Oh, yeah. I can do it. Well, let me, uh, Thanks. Before you stand.